One Saturday, towards the end of summer, as he got ready to drive his wife and John and Sue into the nearby town to do some shopping, Mr. Braithwaite scratched his head and frowned. Here, have you seen my good tweed at, Betty? He asked his wife. Can't fathom where it's gone. Oh, same place as my nice blue scarf, she replied. That went missing two days since, and Harry's been complaining he can't find his good leather gloves. The farmer shook his head as he helped his wife into the car. Ah. Oh, it's a mystery, he sighed. Anyway, let's get out of here before we lose the blooming wheels. Slowing down to take a corner at the outskirts of the village, Mr. Braithwaite frowned as he caught sight of a couple of cyclists going in the opposite direction, laughing uproariously and pointing at his car. What's the matter with them, he wondered out loud. Ah, oh, it's this old car, I expect, answered his wife. I've been telling you for long enough to get a new one. They drove on in silence until, passing another farm very like his own, Mr. Braithwaite spotted a herd of cows being driven into a meadow by a farm labourer and slowed down to cast a professional eye over them. Goggle-eyed with astonishment, the labourer forgot all about his cows and stood stock still staring at the car. A cow pressed against him. He took a pace back to steady himself and slid very slowly and gently down into a half-full ditch. I'm fed up with people laughing at this car, grumbled Mr. Braithwaite. It's not as if it's that old. Well, they wouldn't laugh if you got a nice, new, shiny, posh car, his wife suggested. <laughs> well, if I had a lot of nice, new, shiny, posh money. They came to a crossroads and slowed down to turn left into the market town. And coming towards them on his bicycle, a policeman wobbled precariously as he spotted the car, clutched wildly at his helmet and rode straight into a signpost. What on earth's wrong with them, asked the exasperated farmer. I think it's a nice blue car next time, mused his wife, miles away in her own dreams. It'll go with my scarf, if it ever turns up. Oh, I don't know. Anybody think we've got an ostrich on the roof, the way people are looking? But an ostrich on the roof wouldn't have attracted half as much attention as Wurzel Gummidge did. Having heard about the trip into town from his little Robin Redbreast, he decided to hitch a lift and had slipped onto the roof rack when no one was looking. All the way along, he'd enjoyed himself hugely, a great grin splitting his turnip face as the wind whistled through his straw. Crammed down over his head was Mr. Braithwaite's missing hat, and to keep out the cold, the scarecrow wore Harry's gloves on his twiggy fingers, and Mrs. Braithwaite's scarf was around his broom handle neck. From the roof he waved to passing sheep and shook his fist at crows and rooks. Sometimes he stood up with his arms outstretched in the proper scarecrow position, and sometimes, just for a change, he sat down cross-legged with his arms folded across his chest like a genie on a magic carpet. <laughs> oh, I... That cow human what fell in the ditch were good, but I reckon that dang policeman were better. On the other hand, the cow human got wet, so he did. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, aye. In the car park of the little town, he scrambled down and scuttled away unnoticed. And by the time the children reached the main street, he was yards ahead of them on the other side of the road, peering into the window of Upjohn and Stanley's department store, admiring the display. How did he get into town? cried Sue. What's he come for? That's more important, said John, taking his sister's hand and leading her carefully across the zebra crossing. They found Wurzel Gummidge enraptured, staring at a display of woolens, and in particular at an elaborate, colourful fair aisle pullover slap bang in the centre of the window display. Hello, Wurzel, said Sue nervously. What are you doing in town, John added. And isn't that Mr. Braithwaite's best hat? Yeah, and Harry's gloves, and Mrs. Braithwaite's scarf. The scarecrow managed to tear his attention away from the window, but in his usual fashion, he didn't bother with their questions. Ah, oh, bless me, best and britches. But that's really summit, is that their article? That's really summit. What's that, Wurzel? Sue asked. Why, that they're woolly, of course. You ain't gone blind, have you? Don't the sight of a beautiful woolly like that set all your straw and your innards twitching? They looked with him into the window. John nodded. Hmm, it's a fair hour pullover. Ah, uh, well, uh, uh, what did you say it is? A fair hour pullover. Dang me, I know it was. A fair hour pullover. As soon as I cut my eyes on it, I said to myself, I says, Wurzel, that there's a fair old pullover if ever I saw him. I reckon if I had a fair old pullover like that there, there wouldn't be a crowd that'd come by a hundred miles of me. Hey, 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 Scarecrow, is that a fair old pullover like that? would get an hard-working wife for himself. No bother, quick as winking. Alice provided he had his winking head on, of course. It, it, what's that there sign say above that pulley then? John read it out to him. This week's 
giveaway price bargain. I do it now. I reckon I will have one in Faro pulled up his den for myself. With a fixed expression, he strode forward through the door of the shop. Sue shook her head. Crikey, she whispered. Crikey Moses, echoed her brother. Inside the shop, Wurzel Gummidge was soon deep in a one-sided conversation with a dummy in a wedding dress. Oh, ah, you're a bit of a beauty and no mistake. Yes, young woman, you can stick your nose in the air if you like, but you wait till I get me fair old pulley on. You won't be so tough in those then, I bet. I reckon I might even ask you to marry me, so I might, he concluded, heading for the menswear department. The floor manager spotted him coming. Uh, Miss Simmons, he called his assistant, there's a dirty, disgusting tramp drooling all over your fair isle sweaters. The girl looked vaguely in Wurzel Gummidge's direction. Oh, do you think I've made a sale? Of course not. The rascal's obviously penniless. Drunk too, I shouldn't wonder. Ignore the filthy fellow, and with a little bit of luck, he'll go away. Oh, very good, Mr. Mooney. The scarecrow looked round for service and spotted Miss Simmons. Oi, missus, can you hear me? I, I, I wants one of these here feral pullovers as is given away. Can he parcel one of them up in some feral string and wrapping paper so as I can carry it off? When the girl turned her back on him and studied the far wall, he sniffed angrily. Dang silly woman's deaf as a dead crow. But if she ain't going to serve me, stands the reason I'll have to serve myself. And if I can't have a fair old pullover all wrapped up, I'll just have to wear it now, he decided, picking one up and starting to struggle into it. Come on, then, you dang pesky thing. Get on with thee. I ain't no wonder they're having to give these fair old pullovers away. Dang pesky tarnation things don't go on the body no how. Danger to man and scarecrows that they are did not be allowed. I, I don't know about fair old pullovers. More like a rotten old pullovers, if you ask me. <laughs> Miss Simmons glanced round at him. Uh, Mr. Mooney, that old tramp, he won't go away. Ignore him, Miss Simmons, as I am doing. Pretend he isn't there. Look in the opposite direction. But he's, he's behaving rather oddly, Mr. Mooney. All the more reason, Miss Simmons, to pretend that he isn't there. Oddly, in what way? Well, he's got one of my fair our pullovers over his head, and he isn't moving, Mr. Mooney. Fearful of what he could see, Mr. Mooney turned slowly round and took in the sight of the scarecrow, with a brightly coloured pullover pulled over his head, and his arms rigidly outstretched in the correct scarecrow pose, leaning back against the counter. Oh, really? This is going a bit too far, Miss Simmons. I mean, I'm all for turning a blind eye, but there really is the ballet limit and he strode forward, the girl at his heels. Return that pullover to the counter at once. Do you hear me, my man? Hand over that garment before I summon the store detective and have you charged with theft. There was no response from the deeply sulking scarecrow. Oh, squealed Miss Simmons. Oh, look, he ain't got no fingers, Mr. Mooney. He's got twigs. Oh, would you believe it? He's not a tramp at all, Mr. Mooney. It's a scarecrow. The floor manager's eyes popped. Great heavens! A scarecrow in the men's wear department of Upjohn and Stanley's? How on earth did it get here? And what would Mr. Upjohn say if he were to walk through the store and see it? Oh, let alone Mr. Stanley. What? Boomed a voice from behind string vests. Would Mr. Upjohn say if he were to see what, Mr. Mooney? And Mr. Stanley emerged to confront the perspiring floor manager. Hanging his head, the floor manager shuffled sideways. Miss Simmons said brightly, uh, it, it, It's a scarecrow, Mr. Stanley. A scarecrow? Mr. Mooney nodded, fearing the worst. Uh, I'm afraid so, Mr. Stanley, he whimpered. Brilliant, Mr. Mooney. I never knew you had it in you. To go out and acquire a real scarecrow for the outdoors display in the gardening department. Mr. Mooney gaped. Uh, did I, sir? I mean, uh, yes, I did, sir, Mr. Stanley, sir. He babbled as Miss Simmons gave him a black look. It's a truly remarkable scarecrow's face, Mooney. Exquisite. Do you know... I think it really is quite the ugliest thing I have ever seen in all my life. Uh, now, take it over to the gardening department at once, Mr. Moody. That scarecrow will be the centerpiece of the entire Upjohn and Stanley outdoor display. Hunting through the store, the children found the scarecrow propped up in the middle of yards of artificial grass festooned with watering cans, spades, forks and secateurs. How are we going to rescue him from this lot, asked John despairingly. Well, we can't. He's very quiet, said Sue. Do you think he's still sulking? 
If you pesky titchy humans can't tell the differ between a scarecrow as a sulking and a scarecrow as is proud to be doing a fair old job in the retail trade, you don't know much about scarecrows, so you don't. That's all I got to say. Ignorant kids. Don't know what they're supposed to teach them in school these days. If you're going to be rude, Wurzel, said Sue angrily, don't expect us to help you. If and I need any titchy humans help, young missy, I'll ask for it. Not as it's likely to be yourn, but I ain't here to talk to customers. I'm too important for that, so I am. I'm a centerpiece, so I am. Oh, I, I heard him say that. The scarecrow's nose went up in the air, and he became rigid and lifeless. Saddened and insulted, the two children crept away to look for the toy department, leaving the scarecrow alone. But only for a moment. Just as he was getting to like his work, Mr. and Mrs. Braithwaite appeared and stopped dead in their tracks as they spotted him. Well, if you couldn't knock me down with a feather, is that or isn't that our scarecrow from Ten Acre Field? gasped Mrs. Braithwaite. Her husband shook his head. No, no, ours hasn't got gloves. It hasn't got an hat like that. He peered closer. Just a minute. Well, I'm blessed. That's my hat. That's my best tweedy hat that I lost this morning. Ah, and that's my scarf too. And that is our scarecrow, Jack. I tell you, we ought to see somebody and complain. The oily voice of Mr. Stanley crept up on them unawares. Uh, complain, madam. A complain is a word we don't expect to hear at Upjohn and Stanley's. Mrs. Braithwaite puffed herself up and looked him squarely in the eye. Well, you've heard it now, she said angrily. That's our scarecrow. It was stolen from our field. Her husband whipped his hat off the scarecrow's head and handed it to Mr. Stanley. You take a look inside that hat if you don't believe us. Go on. You tell me what it's got written in there. Turning the hat over, Mr. Stanley read out the name tag. J.M. Braithwaite. The farmer tapped his own chest. Right, that's me, Jack Muscroft Braithwaite. Yes, I see, yes. Well, clearly, uh, some error has occurred. I expect one of our van men picked up the wrong scarecrow. Now, if you'll just step along to the office, I'm sure that all this can be sorted out quite amicably. After all, we're not going to fall out over a common or garden dirty old scarecrow, are we? He finished, leading Mr. and Mrs. Braithwaite off to the offices up on the top floor. Wurzel Gummidge's face clouded over. Dirty? Old? I ain't stopping here, perched up in the plastic grass of being salted, so I ain't. I ain't no common or garden scarecrow neither. I'm a field scarecrow. Always was and always will be. And sooner I gets back to ten acre field, it seems to me, the better off I'll be. And with the trowels and buckets dangling and clattering all over him, he stepped down from his stand and stamped angrily off the display. Inside the car, as they sped home through the countryside, John and Sue were agog to hear all that had happened between the Braithwaites and Mr. Stanley. Well, said the farmer's wife, he didn't say a whole lot, really, only that he was puzzled as how the scarecrow got there, and that he'd send it back as soon as possible, in one of their vans. Well, he can't send it back too soon for me, muttered her husband. I need that scarecrow in Ten Acre Field. He slowed down and peered through the windscreen at a black-clad figure on the road ahead. Er, isn't that that crow man feller? he asked. The children nodded eagerly and turned to wave as they overtook him. He waved back, a slow smile on his face as he stared up at the car's roof rack and saw Wurzel Gummidge raise his hat to him. Oh, Wurzel, Wurzel, what am I to do with you, he laughed, as the little car potted out of sight round the bend and silence descended on the road once more.